Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome onto the stage the wonderful Elaine C. Smith. I missed that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of uh, sort of discussion. Is it too loud? Is this too boomy, my mic? Or should we take it down? You all right? I just don't need to project. I'm an actor. I need to hit the back of the hall. But um, there's been a lot of discussion about celebrities endorsing certain bits of campaigns or not. Um, I would like to say that uh, I'm, I'm here not to tell anyone else how to vote. I'm here to tell you how I'm voting and why I'm voting yes. There are articulate, intelligent people across this land who will make up their own minds about what they do not need somebody for, who is well known to come along and tell them how to vote. This is about us deciding how we want to vote and I'm here simply to articulate <coughs> how I'm going to vote. But I also... I'm not just your common old garden, uh, and I have to say, small time celebrity uh, next to the likes of David Bowie and all of that. But uh, I have been a political activist for 30 years. I, this journey I am on is not just because I decided a couple of weeks ago, I think I'll have an opinion on something. One of the things about David Bowie, marvelous artist that he is, that really made me angry was I thought, wait a minute. When did they pontificate on the Iraq war? When did they have a, a, a political decision? When did they ever have a political opinion about poverty, about what was really going on in this country? Not once. Suddenly, when it comes to Scotland, there's a huge opinion there. And that, for me, just says that there is someone there who doesn't really get it, who doesn't really understand what is going on at the moment and what is at stake. I have been involved in this, and I have to thank Jim Sillers and Margot McDonald because I am on this particular journey because of them. I was always involved in politics as a student, um, of the left, out demonstrating, involved in all that, seeing what was wrong. And I would also like to put paid to a certain mythology that is going around as well, particularly on the left, that all our ills started with Thatcherism. They did not. I was out on marches when I was a student about the education cuts that were being brought in by Jim Callaghan and the Labour government, and we have to get away from that knee-jerk reaction, I think, in the left, too. It was all Thatcher's fault. This stuff was happening to this country long, long before Thatcher came along. And the Thatcher, and also the misogyny that surrounds the whole notion of, of Margaret Thatcher as well, she was surrounded by men who implemented every single one of the policies that her government wanted. But somehow, all the language that was used around about, uh, about ditch the bitch and all of that, I found incredibly offensive. Not any of those policies or her politics or, or that whole conservative era of politics had I anything to do with or in any way supported. But the language around about it and the sort of mythology that has grown up is something that we in Scotland, I think, have to really take seriously. I, being involved in the left, I didn't see that the, the, I was of the notion that the SNP and anyone who supported nationalism was a, a tartan Tory. I sort of bought that until the likes of Jim and Margot McDonald came along. And on a, uh, they asked to meet myself. We, we had fought and we eventually formed something called Artists for an Independent Scotland. And it happened in a meeting, and uh, I will drop some minor celebrity names now, in Pat Kane's house in Peel Street in Partick with Ricky Ross from Deacon Blue with David Heyman. And it was Margot and Jim who saw that there had to be a different way that there had to be a new way of looking at politics and looking at how we engage people that would break that labor stronghold, that labor hegemony, that in many ways was well-intentioned initially, but lost its way, that lost its way in a paternalistic notion that if they did things for people and built them houses, if they dared to complain, then they had, or, or they dared to say, actually, we'd like to do it a wee bit different. In some way, they were insulting the labor movement. They weren't. 
It was about ha a, a, an inability to hand any power back to people. That, for me, is what yes is about. It is about changing things. It is about transforming where we live. And that journey, 20 odd years ago, starting with Artists for an Independent Scotland, I have to say we were vilified. We were, uh, when we started it all, we were seen as um, sort of uh, esoteric artists who didn't have proper politics. Were you really just a front for the SNP? All of those sort of things. But the conversation started then. And what was amazing, one of the best nights of my life actually, was when we did that tentative thing of asking other actors, writers, artists to come along to somebody's house and sit there and discuss the possibility of if the Tories won again, what was Scotland going to do? What was amazing were the people who turned up. I sat in a room with Jim Kelman, Alistair Gray, Liz Lockhead, Edwin Morgan, Willie McIlvanny, Ken Curry, Peter Howson, uh, Dick Gochen, Michael Mara, there are, when you looked around the room, you couldn't believe because every one of us knew something else was happening. Something else had to be done and a different sort of conversation and a different sort of discussion had to happen. So I'm here in my speech really to talk about that journey and to talk about why I'm voting yes. The main reason, however, in all of this, the left politics haven't gone at all. A week ago today, I became a granny. Yes, thank you. Uh, granny Smith now stands before you. You couldn't write it, could you? Anyway, but I figure about a month ago, five weeks ago, while my daughter was still pregnant, I, I figure was released in the Glasgow Herald. And we didn't know what the sex of the baby, it was a wee girl, by the way, but we didn't know what the sex of the baby was. And this figure, one male baby in every four born in Glasgow this year will not live till they're 65. Shame on us. Shame on all of us that we would allow that to happen. I also, I live in the east end of Glasgow where life expectancy for men is still around 58. This is 2014. How can that be possible? If you're, I really should just sit down now because that's why I'm voting yes, because that's the change that is ahead of us, that we will no longer allow this to happen. I remember years ago, I was, I was touring with a show, uh, Calendar Girls, and we opened in Chichester. Now, Chichester's a beautiful place with lovely people, gorgeous theatre, Derek Jacobi and various actors appearing in it over the years. Maggie Smith comes to see the show, all of that. And I loved it. But what I couldn't go over having, you know, toured and performed in Scotland for over 20 years, was that I kept thinking, this, there's something about the audience that, that is very, very different. Well, apart from the fact they didn't laugh in the same places, you know. They tended to go, oh yes, that was a frightfully funny line. Of course, my reaction was, well, could you tell your face that as well? But anyway, <laughs> um, but they would receive it, you know, and, and comment on it rather than just laugh. Anyway. But what I noticed, and it was a few, a couple of weeks into the run, I thought, oh, it's men. The audience was full of men and women in their 70s and 80s because they lived that long. Try going to the Kings in Glasgow to a matinee, not just because men don't want to come and see the show. It's about the fact that they haven't lived that long. For me, that showed the complete difference between the wealth and the, and the educational opportunities, the health that was available in the far southeast of England compared to where I lived in the east end of Glasgow. You don't see men that age. And that is a tragedy. So poverty, that's the core of it for me. Tackling poverty and doing it properly. Because voting yes is about voting for change. Not just a change of government, or a change of sovereignty, but about changing the way we live. And by the way, change is hard. Every psychologist, psychiatrist will tell you, people would rather die than change. We see it in people all the time. They stay in jobs for 30 years that they hate. They stay in relationships that they shouldn't be in. They don't move house when they should. They're frightened. Better the devil we know than the devil out there and all of that stuff. 
But yes is about that chance, a chance to change the way we do things. And we must not ever underestimate the political parties who benefit from this Westminster system. The self-serving elites, the political classes who are concerned about their own pensions, their own jobs, never underestimate the desire and self-interest of those who do not want any change. And that includes some on the left, especially the men. I mean, I've done loads of meetings in, uh, over the last year and uh, who feel a comfort in being back in the old territory, up here on a platform, talking down to people, telling people what they should be thinking and what they should. And that isn't actually transformational change. It's great that they're doing it. It's great that people are engaged. And that is one of the wonderful things about this, to see so many people across the country interested. But it's about listening to them about bringing them in and allowing them to be inspired, not by us telling them how they should be doing it. A top-down style, which the people are supposed to follow, be told what to do, as opposed to that fundamental change in style and attitude that truly reaches and engages every citizen. I am a bit tired of those meetings, and I say to people, please don't send me in the Yes campaign to a meeting where everybody's a yes, because it's preaching to the choir. Uh, it makes us feel good, we feel very comfortable, we're back to the old ways of campaigning, but does it actually engage and change people? <clears throat> I love that involvement, but if we don't change the likes of UKIP and their supposed difference of style, the blokish attitudes that make people feel legitimised about being a wee bit racist or a wee bit right wing, and they will start hoovering up all the people out there who've got a wee grievance about anything political while pretending to be all new and all about change. Their change is about going backwards. It's a regressive step, and we have to counter that on every level. So what does real change mean? Well, for me, that means there's little point in voting to get rid of Westminster being the fourth most, most unequal country in the developed world to becoming the fifth. The main thing for me is tackling poverty, and I mean all aspects, from the poverty that relates to food on the table, but also the poverty of aspiration, poverty of ambition, education, the poverty of ideas, the poverty that is demonstrated so well in our mainstream media and broadcasters, who I have to say have been a disgrace as far as this campaign and the covering of it in Scotland. <laughs> A, a, friend, a friend of mine said to me the other day when, it, when we were talking about uh, the statement by the Church of Scotland in positioning it, trying to position itself within the debate, saying that we needed, uh, you know, a, a reconciliation. So, no, I'm all for that and everything. But I do think, and no political party can say, no, we're no coming. They're all going to have to go, oh, of course we will, and say all the right things. But I do find it really insulting to the people and the thousands and thousands of people who died in South Africa and in Ireland and across the world fighting for their own freedom and going through immense stuff. What, we have to have a, a, a ceremony of reconciliation because somebody slagged somebody? Get a grip. We are better than that. It is within the media as well. That actually, that was the thing that the person said to me. He said, actually, I think the real reconciliation that needs to happen after the referendum will be between the Scottish people and BBC Scotland. <laughs> so we could maybe get a service for that. Anyway, that pervasive, subtle telling the populace that just comes in there in everything. That cringe that you get from the pages of the Scotsman that tells us not good enough. And the tabloids as well. That who do you think you are sort of attitude. A friend of mine yesterday, I was, and, and she's a woman. I play tennis, I like tennis. How middle class is that? But anyway, she's a lovely woman, a woman I've liked. She's of the old Scottish Tory view of most things. But so we always have a bit of a josh. I never really get in an argument because I find that when you actually do that and stand and shout in somebody's face, nobody wins, nobody moves, and nobody really listens to the other. So we always have a bit of a laugh. Anyway, she started saying to me, I take it you'll be voting no then, Ellie, and all that. And I said, no, no, there's no, no voters round this table. Don't you worry, me. Start having a little. 
So it starts off with stuff that I've heard. I don't know whether other people have been hearing this as well. I don't know where these rumors come from. The rumors that Alex Salmond is a fascist. The rumors that the SNP actually, if you rearrange the letters, she said to me, you'll get SS. I don't know how she did that, actually. It's obviously another language she's speaking. But um, the rumors supposedly of affairs between Alec and Nicola Sturgeon, I've had that one a few times, that Alec is a womanizer, he's out there. And actually, my reply is always, do you think if that was true, that wouldn't have been on the front page of the Daily Record? And I've been there a year ago. But that pervasive rumor mill that is out there, you know, briefing against other people, that actually, I can't believe. And the worst thing for me, are people saying things like, well, I get, you know, I'm voting no, why you vote no? I can't go that, Alex Salmon. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> this is not about Alex Salmon or the SNP, though I have to say, I want to thank the SNP for bringing us to this place because we would not be here without them. This is not about Alex Salmon, this is about us. This is about each other, the faith we have in each other and the country we want to create. I couldn't believe the conversation I was having with her yesterday when I got all these, uh, uh, these rumors from her uh, that I, I parried, uh, parried a lot of the time. But her final report to me was, you see, that's it really. There's just nobody here good enough to run things, is there? I'm, uh, I'm serious. I mean, it was gobsmacking. And I said, to which I replied, well, I think there's hunters, actually. And give me any one of them against the public school boys that are running the city in Westminster right at this minute. But that conversation for me tapped into a certain shame, a shame and a cringe that we Scots and uh, certainly the Scots that think they've made it, uh, that seems to run through their DNA. A belief that everything here is really quite pish, isn't it? <laughs> I actually had somebody say to me, oh no, I never allowed my children to watch STV. <laughs> what? And that was uh, from people who had become professors at St. Andrews University or somewhere like that. <laughs> STV was just seen. Now, I did think when STV produced The Hour, program, no offence to MD that was involved now or MD doing that, but I did think it was part of a unionist plot to make us sit at our tellies at five o'clock every day and go, oh Christ, we are shite, aren't we? Right. <laughs> Please don't record that, don't. <laughs> anyway, that thing of being far too worried, my mother's generation, my family, far too worried about what other people think of us. There's a wonderful, if you can't get a hold of Leslie Reddick's book, Blossom, it's a wonderful book about what we need to blossom as a country. And there's a wonderful story she's got in it of a guy who talks, and we do that about where we come from. When people say, where'd you come from? And I do it, I go, oh, darkest Lanarkshire, or, you know, sorry, Motherwell. We apologize before we even, why do we do that? Yeah, and we have a notion that saying we're Scottish is actually something, as Jerry Hassan so brilliantly puts it, something to get over. And once you're over being Scottish, you'll be fine, you know? Everything will be okay. And that we are from a place, but not of it. And that, for me, is really, really sad. There's a quote, and there's another book around just now, Caledonia Dreaming by, by Jerry Hassan. I would, I would recommend it if you want some grown-up stuff in there. And there's a quote he's got in the book from Yeats, after uh, Irish independence. And, and Yeats has this wonderful quote. The moment a nation reached intellectual maturity, it became exceedingly proud and ceased to be vain. And when it became exceedingly proud, it didn't disguise its faults. But when it was immature, it was exceedingly vain, did not believe in itself. And so long as it did not believe in itself, it wanted other people to think well of it in order that it might get a wee bit of reflected confidence. With success came pride, and with real pride came indifference as to whether people were shown in a good light or a bad light. That's where I want to get to. 
I want to get to that point where I actually, when somebody criticizes Scotland, we don't all suddenly have a front page in the Daily Record going, how dare they? Because it's not, it's vanity. It's not real pride in who we are. One of the meetings I did in Denison uh, a few months ago, I was really struck at the end of it when a wee woman stood up, lovely wee woman, and she said, it's a pipe dream. She was in her 70s. How dare you? How dare you peddle all this to us? How dare you tell us that this is possible? And in that moment, I just saw that every single dream that she'd ever had had been taken away from her. And it is now, it's almost like when we talk about dreams, it's like permission to dream. Nothing in this planet would have happened without people dreaming about it, without people imagining what it would be like for women to have the vote, what it would be like for black people not to be slaves in America or here. We have to dream. Will it be perfect? Absolutely not. There is also another quote that I want to give you, which is actually from uh, Oscar Wilde, and it is about utopia. A map of the world that does not include utopia is not worth glancing at, for it leaves out the one country at which humanity is always landing. And when you, you, humanity lands there, it looks out, and seeing a better country sets sail. That's what we are doing now. We are seeing a better country. We are harnessing all our goodwill and setting sail. Will it happen overnight? No, no. I, I, there's a wonderful woman, if you, can, if you ever get to watch her, called Brene Brown, who is a professor in America, and she's on YouTube. She does, uh, uh, there's a TED talk that she did about, and she studies shame. It's a bit of a conversation stopper, she admits, when she tells people, would you study shame, a professor of shame. Um, and she told me when she was, she was speaking at uh, one of the conferences that the guy was on before her, and TED conferences are amazing. They've got all these amazing, wonderful scientists, writers, everybody there, talking about how they've done what they do, very inspiring. And the guy was on before her was a surgeon. And he, said, he was applauded and lauded by everybody because he had invented this particular tool. He was a heart surgeon. And when people said, you know, oh, you're so marvelous. How did you manage this? And, you, and he said, well, when I was doing operations over a period of 20 years, I kept reaching for a tool and it wasn't there. So I decided to build it. And the whole audience burst into applause. And he said, 36 times because 35 times it didn't work. But this 36th time, it does work and it keeps me going. And actually, it's about failure. It's about being prepared to fail in order to get it right in the long run. And we have to be grown up about that and see that that's where we are. Very few people Will it happen overnight? No. Uh, there's a great quote, actually, it's not often I quote Michael Portillo, but, um, Michael Portillo said, as a staunch unionist, that there was absolutely no doubt in his mind that the union had infantilized the Scots. And I believe that to be true. I believe devolution has allowed us to become adolescents. Um, you know, we've got to uni, but we're still taking our washing home for our mother to do and all that. Independence for me in many ways will be about being able to move into my own flat, will be a, about buying a washing machine and maybe even getting HP to pay it up. That's about being grown up. That's the type of country I want to live in. Not about blaming other people, not about blaming another race. I have not one iota of anti-English uh, sentiment in my body at all. My politics are about where power lies. And I want the power brought back here. And I want us to talk about doing it in a different way. There, there are groups and ways that we have to do this differently. I want groups that will address how we can transcend the limited democracy. And we do have a limited democracy. We say we're, it's a parliamentary democracy. I don't believe real democracy is here. Uh, it aids, uh, the limited democracy of modern Scotland aids cynicism and defeatism. We need to contribute to a radical public culture 
and professionalism. One of the central features would be how we bring up and nurture Scotland's children, so many of whom live, as Jim says, in poverty with blighted lives. How we support and care for disadvantaged children and their families. If the Scotland many of us aspire to is about anything, it is about reaching out to our children who the current status quo so conspicuously fails and acting from the premise that this is the responsibility of all of us. All of us, starting from, and a particular onus falls on professional and middle class people, to lead, to inspire, contribute to mending a society which has left so many behind and seem to give up on them. This entails a const an institutional change in Scotland in the public, private and voluntary sectors and for the rest of us. I remember a friend saying that the first time she voted SNP in the last election, she realised she was doing it because she was going to have to show up. Because it was no longer about saying, oh, we'll just leave it to them. Somebody else will look. And that's about what this change is about. For me, that transformational change starts with a yes vote. Because if you vote no, I mean, I got a lot of my pals on the left going, ah, but uh, where are they definitely going to get rid of Trident? Well, no, overnight we're not. Be realistic. We're not. But the aim is to get rid of it. If we vote no, there is no aim. If we vote no, there is no change. And there is no belief in what uh, any, they're not telling us in any ways, they're giving us the carrots they gave in 79 as well, about, oh, well, we'll have a wee bit of change. We don't even know who's going to be in government. We're, the only way to start the change that is so necessary for the people who need it the most and the rest of us to live in a society and a country we can be truly proud of starts with a yes vote. That's why I'm voting yes. Thank you. Thank you.